distal femur fractures. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5. Slides are by Dr. David Stockton, and I'm Sakib Rahman narrating. So top five learning objectives for this lecture are to understand the osteology and deforming forces with distal femur fractures, uh, understand a little bit about classification. Uh, this is a case where OTA uh, classification really can be helpful. Um, understand treatment options and considerations, uh, understand surgical approaches, and uh, go through the different fixation options. So uh, these injuries account for 7% of all femur fractures as a bimodal distribution, like with many um, fractures we see with high energy injuries in the younger patients and low energy uh, fractures in the elderly patients. Um, historically, these have been treated non-surgically with skeletal traction uh, until uh, AO techniques improved uh, the angled blade uh, plate and dynamic condylar screws were some of the earlier devices that that allowed for fixed angle fixation. Um, and then uh, locking plates in the mid 2000s started to, uh, or early to mid 2000s started to come out and um, we still continue to use those. There've been improved plate designs and um, other interesting technologies such as uh, far cortical locking uh, in order to better distribute um, stress across the uh, fracture site, uh, medial to lateral, and um, intramedullary nails that are designed to help fix distal femur fractures in combination of different implants uh, to continue to uh, uh, improve uh, or attempt to improve our patient outcomes. So a couple of words about the osteology. The uh, shaft of the femur is aligned with the anterior half of the lateral condyle. And there is an, uh, there's nine degrees of valgus, like seven to 11 degrees. Um, so you always have to keep that in mind when you're reconstructing these uh, to try and restore that. Uh, also, uh, what a lot of people um, sometimes tend to forget is that the distal femur is trapezoidal. So, uh, you know, where your implants go, anterior to posterior, um, is going to cause it to, uh, you know, potentially be, you know, do, so your distal femur, for example, is, I'm going to show you in the bottom drawing here, the distal femur is going to be uh, shorter from medial to lateral as you go more anterior and much wider uh, as you go posteriorly. So this has implications for a lot of things. Uh, for instance, plate fixation. Uh, if the plate is designed, you know, by, if it's a pre-contoured plate and is designed to sit in a certain position, anterior versus posterior, if you place it in the other position, that may cause, uh, for instance, excessive translation. And we'll show this uh, we get to some of the later slides when you go ahead and fix that to the shaft, for example. Um, other things to keep in mind, uh, even when you're doing uh, intramedullary nailing, even if you're treating just a femoral shaft, uh, let's say with a retrograde intramedullary nail, when you place distal interlocking screws, I mean, you could place a screw that is sitting almost this proud off the bone, um, and you get an AP x-ray, and it's going to look like on the x-ray that you're okay. And it's not until you get a rotated view to realize that that screw is actually proud or the tip of the screw is proud. And these can be issues with um, uh, implant prominence, screw prominence, uh, even just for interlocking screws for a retrograde femoral nail. So um, injury considerations, you wanna make sure you understand the mechanism of injury. Uh, again, younger patients are gonna have higher energy trauma, lower uh, energy falls are gonna happen more frequently in the elderly. Uh, but this type of deforming force that you see here on the right is uh, very important to understand. So with the quadriceps, there's gonna be some shortening and the hamstrings are gonna cause some shortening. And then the gastrocnemius, which you remember, uh, originates on the posterior aspect of the distal femur uh, is going to cause this type of angulation and displacement, right? Uh, so you're going to get uh, basically, you know, this fragment is going to rotate basically in this direction. 
and shorten this way a little bit. So uh, this is what you need to deal with when you, you know, have to reduce these fractures is to consider that um, deforming force. Uh, these can be open fractures in 5 to 10% of cases. Uh, occasionally, there can be knee ligament concomitant injuries uh, and other injuries, tibial plateau fractures, acetabulum, patella, etc. So, um, obviously, consider also the you know, ambulatory status of the patient, pre existing knee arthritis. Um, and on physical exam, uh, examine for other injuries, run through ATLS. Uh, you want to make sure you get a good neurovascular status. Uh, make sure there's no uh, potential for arterial injury. Uh, look at the soft tissues. And uh, if you do have some concern, uh, like a diminished pulse, certainly expanding hematoma, uh, then you may need to consider a CT angiogram or obviously for persistent uh, obvious arterial bleeding, you may need to you know, go right to the operating room with... Uh, with the appropriate personnel to handle a vascular injury. So uh, workup um, orthogonal views, like any other plane films, a couple of interesting things you might see. So for instance, on the AP, if you see this double density sign, that could indicate that there is a coronal plane fracture as shown in the CT scan below. Uh, and uh, you have the so-called Hoffa fracture. Um, and this is uh, shown here, it's often not a perfectly coronal plane fracture. It could be a little bit oblique like this, but uh, nevertheless, this is not like a, you know, a medial or a lateral condylar fracture. Uh, we'll go through the classification in, in a minute. The other thing is remember the deforming forces. We showed you a couple of slides back. Um, because of that, that distal fragment, you know, is flexing, so you can get what looks to be like. A notch view, right? So sort of a view that you would maybe get in the outpatient setting um, to assess uh, the notch or you have the knee in a flexed position when you're shooting the x-ray as well. Here the patient doesn't have the knee flexed. It's just that the distal fragment is flexed because of the deforming forces of the gastrocnemius. And you may get this view that looks like sort of a paradoxical notch view. So the Hoffa fracture just, you know, don't miss it. Uh, it is sort of a, somewhat of a peculiar fracture. It's kind of hidden back there. Uh, and um, it is frequently missed, but picked up on CT scan. So I have a low threshold to get a CT scan, certainly in the higher energy patterns. So prior to classifying fractures, consider, you know, the just your, your, all these factors here, amount of displacement, degree of comminution, soft tissue injury, all these things are going to help you assess your patient and come to determine a treatment plan. What's the bone quality like? Do they have great bones? Do they have severe osteoporosis? Are there associated injuries that you need to take care of? And you know, is that coronal fracture line there? So as I mentioned at the outset, uh, distal femur fractures is a nice uh, application of uh, the AOOTA uh, fracture classification. Um, it works pretty well here uh, for understanding the fracture pattern and also determining treatment. So it's the distal, well, firstly, it's the femur, so it's bone three, distal segment 33. Uh, so you have the extra articular supracondylar fractures, right? That's a 33A. Uh, and those can be simple, they can be comminuted. Um, uh, you have the partial articulars, which are the 33B, right? So a lateral is a. Um, like a B1, a medial is like a B2, and then half a fracture is like a B3. And then a complete articular fracture means that you have uh, an intraarticular fracture with a supracondylar fracture, right? So it means all the articular fragments are dissociated from the shaft. So here's some examples of that. This is the you know, 33A on the left. Uh, there is a uh, partial articular fracture shown uh, in the middle there, and then the complete articular fracture. Uh, and then, of course, we can break these down. I kind of gave some descriptions already. You can have sort of simple fractures, um, or you can have more comminuted fractures. And, you know, how you fix these may vary. For instance, like a, you know, a fracture like this shown below, you may consider fixing with like bridge plating or retrograde intramedullary nailing, um, for example, uh, whereas uh, maybe a more uh, simple fracture <clears throat> like this, you may choose to treat with, um, you know, anatomic compression plating. Uh, 
uh, or perhaps an intramedullary nail. Uh, the partial articular fractures, these are the ones that, uh, you know, B, right? So in the AO courses, they teach you B is for buttress. So typically, um, you know, the, the, the like a lateral condyle, like the B1s here, uh, these can typically be treated with a buttress plate. The medial uh, condylar fractures similarly can be treated with, you know, interfragmentary screws and buttress plating medially. Um, locked plating is not typically required for these injury patterns unless you have osteoporosis. And then the C, uh, I'm sorry, the B3s are these um, kind of half of this coronal plane fracture in the back. And um, because you don't have as much, uh, you know, bone uh, that's not articular to work with, sometimes these are not always treated with a buttress plate and may just uh, require screws alone. And uh, that's how they are frequently treated. And the C types, as we mentioned, these are complete articular, means all the articular fragments are dissociated from the shaft, right? So these have to be open, they have to be um, uh, fixed, unless perhaps you have a non-displaced split um, maybe that would not need to be opened. Uh, but um, typically, if there's displacement of the articular surface, these are opened and then treated with open reduction internal fixation. Uh, although um, in some of the uh, uh, simple types here, uh, for example, um, something like this, you could conceivably treat with a retrograde, with, with like interfragmentary screws and then a retrograde intramedullary nail. So some of the simple C1s can possibly be treated that way. Um, and um, if you have something like this in an elderly patient, um, you could consider distal femoral replacement. Um, so our, the classification in the distal femur um, using AOOTA classification, I think really does help you understand the fracture patterns and uh, what's gonna be required uh, from a management standpoint, from a surgical management standpoint. So let's talk about indications. So um, relative indications for non-operative management would be a patient who has uh, maybe is non-ambulatory and has significant medical uh, contraindications to surgery. So you have a supracondylar fracture, patient doesn't ambulate and has severe um, you know, cardiovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, um, uh, pulmonary issues, et cetera. Um, and may not be the best surgical candidate. Um, there could be fracture factors, a non-displaced fracture that you're uh, able to uh, watch carefully, um, and um, that could be treated non-surgically, certainly from the outset. Uh, maybe an impacted stable fracture, maybe a fracture that's non-reconstructable with severe osteopenia, um, perhaps. Um, uh, although uh, sometimes in an elderly patient, you could consider replacement for those. Um, or surgeon factors who just, you know, you don't have the experience managing this or not able to get this patient, you know, to a facility where it can be um, treated. Um, and uh, so non-operative treatment is not that common um, for most of these displaced uh, fractures, um, but uh, there are some cases to treat non-surgically. Uh, you could use a long leg cast followed by a hinge knee brace. Uh, but you do want to try to get some early range of motion to avoid stiffness. And uh, this is evidence from the British JBS, JBJS 1996 in a randomized control trial. Um, uh, so somewhat of an older study and um, definitely showing that uh, operative management works, works better for these. Uh, so the majority of these distal femur fractures are going to require operative management with the goals of uh, restoring anatomic reduction of the articular surface, functional reduction of the metaphysis to get length alignment rotation, restoring mechanical axis and anatomic axis of the limb, uh, getting stable fixation, early range of motion. So uh, if these look familiar, these comprise um, your AO basic principles. And of course, attention to um, preservation of the soft tissues. So, uh, your most common workhorse approach is going to be a lateral approach to the distal femur. Uh, this is a skin incision in line with, or in, in mid-lateral line of the femoral shaft, curving slightly anteriorly, um, distally towards the tibial tubercle. Um, the distal extent is determined by the need for joint arthrotomy. So if you are doing um, 
you know, if you don't have to open the joint, look in the joint, and, you know, you just need to get screw fixation distally, you may not have to curve that far anteriorly. If you need to really open up the joint and do a lateral parapatellar arthrotomy, then you need to bring that incision more anteriorly as you get distal. I think the proximal extent depends on are you doing indirect reduction and percutaneous fixation with your plate, uh, like a MIPO technique, or, or are you having to open everything up proximally? Are you, you know, is it a periprosthetic, you're putting in cables, or you need to just do a direct visualization? Uh, you in, uh, divide the iliotibial band, incise the vastus lateralis uh, fascia, you elevate from um, distal to proximal, and uh, elevate the muscle anteriorly, and um, ligate the uh, perforating vessels. Um, so if you need to get more articular exposure, again, you can bring that incision much more anteriorly, uh, and there is the reference for this uh, popular uh, modification of the approach. Um, <clears throat> so distally, it's a m more midline incision, and then curves laterally as you go proximally, and you do this lateral parapatellar arthrotomy. So this is very commonly done. Um, or exposure of the joint as well as uh, getting good uh, extensile exposure proximally. Medial approaches are useful for isolated medial condyle fractures or really comminuted fractures when you have to do both medial and lateral fixation. So be, get, make sure you get familiar with the anatomy uh, medially here. Uh, it's straight medial incision extending distally to a point just anterior to the adductor tubercle. Uh, you divide the fascia in line with the skin incision anterior to the sartorius, elevate the vastus medialis, taking care to avoid the articular branch of the descending geniculate artery and the muscular branch of the vastus medialis as shown here. Um, and, um, you know, this can get you good exposure for those medial condylar fractures, or again, if you need to do a dual plating uh, technique. So, uh, for intramedullary nailing, you just have to do a limited anterior approach, either a transpatellar uh, incision or go medial uh, parapatellar. Um, the start point is just anterior to the femoral origin of the PCL, uh, and this is shown very nicely here on these two views with the reference given there. Uh, you should be centered in the shaft on the AP and just at that anterior edge of Blumensatz line on a perfect lateral x-ray. So you're going to look for this, and you're just going to be just anterior to it, and then you should be directed you know, at this sort of midpoint here. And it's important when you're doing this to make sure your fracture is reduced so uh, you avoid some uh, deformity. Um, now, getting your reduction, it can certainly be helpful to have a patient paralyzed so they're not fighting you um, with their muscles. Uh, a bump under the knee, uh, and certainly under that very, very distal fragment, helps to correct that apex posterior deformity by relaxing the gastrocnemius muscle. Um, um, and then you can use things like a distractor, perhaps. Uh, you just have to make sure that you set your pins up and load them properly um, to avoid uh, angular uh, deformity that happens when you do distract. Um, so for example, if you, um, you'll see as you use the distractor, um, that it can create angulation. So sometimes you have to build in uh, the anticipated angulation in reverse in your um, distractor so that when you ultimately end up distracted, you go back to back to sort of the normal position that you're trying to achieve. Uh, K-wires, uh, of course, uh, very helpful here. Uh, and just if you can avoid where your plate position is going to be, uh, that will allow you to keep the pins in there while you place your plate. Uh, large uh, periarticular type reduction forceps can be helpful. I would also add here mini fragment plates. Um, so mini plates can be used as a reduction tool. You get your reduction. Maybe it's not appropriate for a K-wire necessarily. Uh, a small mini plate uh, that's out of the way of your definitive fixation can really be a nice way to hold your reduction. Types of fixation. Um, so you have lateral pre-contoured plates. These are very common. These can be used for most fracture patterns, retrograde intramedullary nails. Many of them now have a lot of distal locking options uh, designed to fix distal femur fractures. Uh, 
Uh, and again, A-type fractures can be fixed like we talked about previously with retrograde nails uh, and even some simple like C1-type uh, fractures where you have, um, uh, you can get um, maybe lag screw fixation outside the direction of where your rod is going to go and then uh, instrumentally renailing uh, with uh, multiple fixation points uh, with your nail. Um, older type devices include the dynamic condylar screw and angled blade plate. Uh, I've mentioned this a couple times. Distal femoral replacement is also an option in the elderly, uh, perhaps with pre-existing arthritis, severely comminuted, and a need to kind of get them weight-bearing immediately. Um, and there are studies um, you can certainly look up uh, regarding uh, this and this versus uh, this, uh, versus fixation. Uh, and then um, there are augmented fixation where you can do medial and lateral plates, nail plate combinations, a lot more literature uh, very recently uh, on, uh, on nail plate combinations uh, in 2023. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, buttress plating for Hoffa fractures is usually not uh, that red, you know, it's not that accessible to do that, or, and the bone is not, you don't have as much bone to work with. Um, so, um, you know, buried screw fixation, you know, headless screws are a great uh, thing here uh, for these kind of fracture patterns, for example. So, lateral pre contoured plates um, shown here, um, you know, this could be something that you uh, reduced with lag screws and then are using as a neutralizing plate. Uh, it could be a comminuted uh, fracture you're treating with a bridge plate like above. Uh, it could be um, a, like a B-type fracture that you're treating uh, with just a buttress plate, as shown below. Um, these have locking options nowadays, a fixed angle, variable angle locking. Variable angle can be very helpful if you're dealing with a periprosthetic distal femur fracture and you have you know, s implants in your way, essentially. Uh, and these have largely replaced the dynamic condylar screw and blade plate. Um, so th there is some, you know, the concept of stress modulation and sort of this concept of manipulating bridge plating variables to, op to optimize flexibility to allow callus formation. There's some concern that you know, non-unions do occur in the distal femur, uh, upwards of 20% plus, and... Um, Perhaps, uh, you know, these are being fixed too rigidly. Perhaps there's a material issue. Perhaps there's something we can do to optimize, you know, fixation versus rigidity. Uh, I mentioned this term before about far cortical locking. Um, that's a technology you can, you can look up also to understand why that might be uh, something to consider. Uh, how long should your plate be? How many screws are you filling, etc.? cetera? So, um, now, this concept of far cortical locking is trying to, it, what essentially you're doing is, you know, you have a locking screw. So, you know, the screw is locked here. Uh, the screw engages the far cortex here. But then in order to diminish the sort of stress shielding at the near cortex uh, and allow for more equal motion under the plate, you actually drill out um you drill out, so this is allowed this delta D degree of motion, um, and uh, you actually uh, allow for some motion under the plate where normally there's much less motion under the plate. So you try to get more evenly distributed micro motion, and um, so this is an interesting concept, and uh, it's probably worth um, understanding and looking into. And this is a way to try and see if we can optimize our healing. So let's go through some case examples. Here's a 59-year-old male, uh, workplace injury, unfortunately large marble slab fall on his leg and does have actually some pre-existing osteoarthritis. Um, and this is a patient treated with uh, open reduction internal fixation. Um, and you can see actually this was uh, utilizing that far cortical locking uh, technology and um, fracture goes on to heal with good alignment. Uh, we talked about some of the older uh, devices, the condylar screw, um, the uh, blade, for example. The um, uh, LIS system is also one of the, you know, one of the first uh, periarticular locking plates. Um, it's still in use, and uh, it has uh, self-drilling unicortical screws proximally. 
so there is some data um, showing um, uh, certainly some of the earlier and um, use of these devices, but they're still around and uh, many surgeons continue to prefer to use these. Um, but uh, this is a fully locked device uh, with pre-drilling or self-drilling uh, unicortical screws proximally and all, all locking screws distally. So I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, non-union rates um, can be, you know, 20% plus um, uh, up to 31%. And uh, here's a couple of uh, retrospective studies showing uh, that uh, non-union rates happen a little more than we would like them to. Uh, and perhaps we should be doing things a little bit differently in order to um, to uh, avoid that. And there are some um, concepts brought up in both of those papers. Uh, intramedullary nailing um, is, is an attractive option uh, for certain fracture patterns. Like I said, the A types, the C1 types, it minimizes disruption of the soft tissues. Uh, a lot of modern nails now have a lot of improved designs with multiple distal screw options like shown here. Some of them have blades. Uh, they're sort of set up to engage short segments distally. Um, Keep in mind, a retrograde nail usually is extended you know, up to the level of lesser trochanter, and uh, you want to get proximal locking as well. Um, and a grade nails could be an option uh, if you have a segmental fracture um, and uh, you have a very, very high proximal sort of supracondylar fracture, uh, and you can get the nail distal enough. Uh, and just like with any nailing technique, just remember, you got a nail, it's not going to reduce um, a metaphyseal fracture for you like it will sometimes with a mid-diaphyseal simple fracture. So you have to make sure you hold your fracture reduced prior to instrumenting and, and then putting your implant in. A couple of words on the um, uh, dynamic condylar screw and angled blade. Um, these can still be used uh, a lot of times for in revision scenarios or non-unions. Um, they are fairly stiff constructs. Uh, keep in mind there is a technique um, that takes into account the uh, trapezoidal shape of the distal femur, uh, like I talked about earlier, and um, inserting this. So you have to make sure that you're parallel to the joint distally and also uh, perpendicular to the uh, face of the, uh, of lateral, of the lateral femur uh, in order to make sure you place this properly. So here's an example, 68 year old male, um, open segmental, comminuted distal femur fracture, pretty bad injury, gets treated with open reduction internal fixation. Uh, this looks to be a bridge plating technique, persistent pain uh, at one year, uh, no obvious infection, uh, and um, just looks to be a non-union. And uh, this was actually revised uh, with fixation with a dynamic condylar screw, and uh, this does go on to heal. A couple of words about distal femur replacement, that is joint replacement with actually using like tumor um, salvage uh, um, distal femoral components. Um, so the advantages are uh, you can allow immediate weight bearing as opposed to a fracture fixation construct where you may um, you know, have them non-weight bearing for a period of time, which is typically done for intraarticular fractures in the lower extremities. Uh, so you don't really have risks of malunion, non-union, fixation failure, et cetera. Um, disadvantages are, um, you know, there are limited salvage options in cases of, you know, if you get osteolysis or you get loosening, I mean, you've already replaced everything, uh, periprosthetic fracture, infection, and head-to-head -head results um, have not been, you know, that much in favor of doing these. I mean, in many cases, it, it seems logical. It's an older patient. I want to get them up walking right away. I want to just replace them. And there's a lot of blood loss. A, there's a lot of morbidity. Uh, you do this to an elderly patient and just tell them to get up and walk right away. It's easier said than done. Um, so the clinical data is probably not quite as uh, um, advantageous as we thought this could be, but this is certainly an option. Uh, what about augmentation? So lateral plate augmented with a medial plate or lateral plate augmented with an intramedullary nail. 
uh, so-called nail plate. And these can be useful to avoid varus failure. So if you have a fracture, you know it's going to take a while to heal. You have a lot of bone loss medially. We dual plate in the proximal tibia, um, but we don't seem to dual plate in the distal femur very often, but sometimes you do. Um, and uh, a, a nail plate combination is also becoming very popular. A lot of literature being published very recently on that. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, in those cases, you can often wait bare early and not fear so much the uh, risk of uh, varus collapse. What about that Hoffa fracture? So <clears throat> this is caused by a shear moment through the posterior condyle. Um, <clears throat> do not miss these fractures. Um, as we talked about earlier, uh, up to 30, 31% of these can be missed. Uh, if you get a CT scan, uh, you're... Uh, less likely to miss these. So if you see that double density sign on the AP x-ray, get a CT scan, make sure you know what you're looking at. Um, and uh, these are frequently fixed with uh, lag screws. And sometimes if you're coming directly onto the fragment, you can also use like headless screws. In this particular case, to show you an example with uh, lag screws from anterior to posterior uh, inserted um, outside of the articular cartilage. So uh, traditionally, as I mentioned before, um, these are intraarticular fractures, and uh, certainly in the B and C types, and uh, traditional rehab is non-weight bearing for up to 12 weeks. Uh, maybe we're, we're holding our patients back too much. Uh, there's new evidence suggesting intermediate or early weight bearing doesn't necessarily increase fixation failure rates. Um, and a couple of papers shown here uh, with um, uh, really no uh, ad no significant increase in adverse events or fixation failure. So should make you think twice about um, about holding back all of your patients. Uh, range of motion is typically initiated post-op. Uh, you make it. You could also consider um, continuous passive motion if that's available to you uh, to prevent stiffness. And if it's an older patient that has a new osteoporotic fracture, you may want to make sure that they are being properly managed medically for osteoporosis um, by their physician. So these are the references, and uh, many of them were in the slides as we went through. Thank you very much.